Hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Jardina. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of California, Davis. And my paper is titled The Gimmicks and Poetics of Geoengineering. And I'll dive right in. Geoengineering may turn out to have been a fad. As Holly Jean Buck hopes in her 2019 book, After Geoengineering, Climate, Tragedy, Repair, and Restoration, geoengineering will be an unrecognizable word to future generations because, quote, it's a weird artifact of the early 21st century. In this paper, I trace the history of the idea of a human-designed Earth system in order to describe how the aesthetics of geoengineering reflect and disguise the lived contradictory experiences of climatological crisis, much like how the aesthetics of the gimmick emerge from the lived experience of capitalistic crisis, as C.N. Nye claims in The Theory of the Gimmick. Nye's gimmick develops in the shadow of capitalism's volatility, and so it's both banal and extreme, both too much and never enough. Geoengineering is likewise both a godlike planetary scale project and a risky, inadequate answer to the human and non-human costs of climate change that have already been incurred. I take the work of Erasmus Darwin, inventor, physician, natural philosopher, and poet, as a case study to consider how poetry negotiates the contradictions of geoengineering. Writing at the turn of the 19th century, Darwin valorizes contrivances like the steam engine through his highly formalized epic poems, including the Botanic Garden and the Temple of Nature. In one passage, Darwin suggests a project in which, quote, the nations who inhabit this hemisphere of the globe artificially relocate Arctic icebergs to the equator, which would improve the global climate for human comfort. This moment, through its formal aestheticization of human Earth system design, reads as a triumphant solution, while its accompanying footnotes quietly mention its violent risks. I claim that the temporal contradictions of geoengineering necessitate a poetics that is capable of including them. In the midst of a climatological crisis, however, these tensions never remain unseen for long. My intention in this paper is not to straightforwardly prove that 21st century geoengineering is a gimmick according to Nye's definition. Rather, I wanna posit geoengineering as an aesthetic category whose affinities with the gimmick reveal the contradictions it is capable of occluding. I claim that in occluding these contradictions, geoengineering is able to remain a seductive, techno-utopian solution to anthropogenic climate change despite its obvious risks, inequities, and inadequacies. For Nye, the extravagantly impoverished form of the gimmick indexes the contradictions of capitalism and its impetus towards accumulation of surplus value through increasing the ratio of dead labor to living labor. The gimmick also resists critique, however. In arousing repulsion, incredulity, or an aesthetic and critical response to its ostentatious display of ugliness or absurdity, the gimmick encourages a dissipation of criticality that occludes the labor relations its creations depends on. Quote, protected by its own slickness, Nye writes, as a thing whose sheer stupidity cleverly neutralizes the critical feeling it incites, the gimmick defends itself from intellectual curiosity in a way that puts any person seeking to analyze it at, at a comical disadvantage. Similarly slippery, <laughs> similarly slippery and contradictory, the word geoengineering conjures images of flashy, unwieldy, and absurd solutions to anthropogenic climate change, and yet the term also remains plausibly systematic and reasonable, gesturing toward a logical extension of the technological progress we have already witnessed. Seemingly trying to walk the line between this, these aesthetic extremes, techno-utopian arguments in support of geoengineering overtly place their faith in the restorative abilities of technology while also minimizing geoengineering's aesthetic absurdity. Arguably beginning with Paul Crutzen's watershed essay on stratospheric sulfur injections, which sort of cracked open the 21st century geoengineering discourse in 2006, geoengineering must always be plan B, a Hail Mary, end of the line, worst case scenario option. In his 2021 book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, for example, Bill Gates writes, quote, geoengineering is a cutting edge, 
break glass in case of emergency kind of tool. But geoengineering is the only known way that we could hope to lower the Earth's temperature within years or even decades without crippling the economy. There may come a day when we don't have a choice. Best to prepare for that day. From this perspective, investing in geoengineering research is simply rational. It's a Pascal's wager for a deteriorating planet. Despite these abundant rationalizations, the very aesthetics of geoengineering have remained a little embarrassing or even silly. And so its proponents must preemptively acknowledge and rationalize its absurdity in order to seriously suggest it as a viable solution to climate change, however secondary or end of the line. The aesthetic judgments that gimmicks and geo geoengineering elicit, cheapness, absurdity, stupidity, or too muchness, reflect the contradictions of capitalism that bring them into existence. The repulsion we feel toward the gimmick's flashiness, Nye claims, quote, not only reflects the capitalist mode of production's innermost laws, but the daily ways in which we interact with the economic abstractions these laws precipitate from wages to rents. <clears throat> While the aesthetic experience of the gimmick indexes the individual's lived experience of capitalism, the aesthetics of geoengineering veil the larger scale and temporal contradictions of capitalism as a world ecology. Unlike the gimmick whose flashiness is a point is born of um, capitalist fixes to create surplus value in individual and daily lives, geoengineering is a fix that intends to reproduce the ecological conditions that allow capitalism to continue unfettered. Imagined as a worst case scenario option, geoengineering always justifies its preemptive existence with a theoretical future world that is infinitely beyond repair. As a Hail Mary solution, it offers an end point or a fix to an ongoing complexity of problems that we're living with in the present. When we talk about geoengineering, we are often talking about a punctuation mark, a discrete act that will bring the preceding crisis to a business-like end. And yet this imagined perfunctory future solution has material effects now in the midst of increasing ecological ruin. Though Gates cautions his audience against thinking of geoengineering as a panacea, he has invested at least $4.6 million in the fund for innovative climate and energy research, which has authorized the distri distribution of millions of dollars to geoengineering researchers since 2007. This is only one facet of G Gates's geoengineering funding habits though. And in addition to other ventures, he is also a major investor in carbon engineering, which is a direct air capture firm. The Pascal's wager of an imagined future geoengineering, rather than acting as a logical failsafe, has a material effect on the likelihood that geoengineering will be implemented in our ongoing and incomplete present. As cultural studies scholar Tina Sika writes, quote, vested interests that arise out of continued geoengineering research as a result of investment commitments and bureaucratic inertia would also make its large scale use significantly more likely. This tendency for financial investments to be reinforced and prioritized isn't quite the slippery slope argument, but is rather a capitalist self-fulfilling prophecy. Geoengineering as we know it is and will be born of a temporal contradiction between an imagined future complete solution and the ongoing incomplete realities of our climate crisis ridden present. The contradictory gerund-like nature of the word geoengineering both a noun and a verb, both fixed and ongoing, is occluded by its flashy aesthetic character. I'll now turn to Erasmus Darwin to showcase how his poetics occlude the temporal contradictions of geoengineering and to ultimately suggest the existence of geoengineering poetics in the 21st century. First though, a brief history. Unlike the gimmick, which emerges during mature crisis prone stages of capitalism, the idea of a human designed earth system stretches back millennia, transforming but persisting throughout the theological history of Europe. It arguably began in 500 BCE with Anaxagoras, was adopted by the Stoics, Christianized by medieval scholars like St. Augustine, secularized throughout the 18th and 19th century, and then militarized in the 20th. The argument from design, which is the assumption that the apparent purposiveness of natural objects and systems is the result of designs by a creator, is undergirded by an analogy between human artisans and an, an, an omnipotent divine designer. In The Nature of the Gods, Cicero's avatar of Stoicism, Balbus claims, for example, quote, 
if then nature's attainments transcend those achieved by human design, and if human skill achieves nothing without the application of reason, we must grant that nature too is not devoid, devoid of reason. Balbus, and essentially every other natural theologian in European history, bases his knowledge of a designer god on the reasonableness of a human designer. Eventually, Erasmus Darwin's own grandson, Charles, and other 19th century evolutionary thinkers leveraged the design argument to understand the transmutation of species and to illustrate it to a Victorian public. And so the assumption of intentionality in natural systems or a tele teleological framework allows for the analysis of those systems. Additionally, however, a teleological framework also conceptually justifies the human manipulation of those same systems. When we think about manipulating the earth system to achieve a particular end, then we aren't so much hubristically adopting the powers of an omnipotent God, but are recognizing the historical genealogy of our contemporary ideas of an earth designing creator, human creativity. Erasmus Darwin does exactly this in his popular epic poem, The Botanic Garden, which was published in two parts in 1789 and 1791. Uh, uh, I have a typo in my thing. 1791. Arguably beginning um, the popular science genre, the botanic garden describes biological specimens and cutting edge scientific achievements, including those of Benjamin Franklin, Joseph Priestley, Josiah Wedg Wedgwood, Matthew Bolton, and James Watt. Darwin's aim in publishing the poem was to, quote, enlist imagination under the banner of science in order to cultivate the knowledge of botany. In adopting the design argument and reviving its foundation of human creativity, Darwin unproblematically unprob imagines the manipulation of weather patterns to better serve human comfort. So in a section where the action of the poem is guided by the subtle work of nymphs, Darwin writes, quote, their nymphs alight array your dazzling powers with sudden march alarm the torpid hours on ice built islands expand a thousand sails hinge the strong helms and catch the frozen gales the winged rocks to feverish climates guide in an accompanying footnote he writes quote if the nations who inhabit this hemisphere of the globe, instead of destroying their seamen and exhausting their wealth in unnecessary wars, could be induced to unite their labors to navigate these immense masses of ice into the more southern oceans, two great advantages would result to mankind. The tropic countries would be much cooled by their solution, and our winters in this latitude would be rendered much milder for perhaps a century or two, till the masses of ice became again enormous. This moment's soaring optimism is betrayed a little bit by the last few words of the note, which imply that this large scale intervention must always remain ongoing and incomplete since the icebergs will, will always eventually accumulate again. Humans must intercede continually if the two hemispheres of the globe are to enjoy their new weather, weather patterns with any degree of permanence. The verse that accompanies this disappointing footnote never wavers, however. Instead, Darwin's poetry skates across the inconsistencies and risks mentioned in his footnotes, maintaining an optimistic view of human climate manipulation. Similarly, in a later passage, Darwin envisions the steam engine as an already perfect contrivance that is in balance with the natural systems it inhabits. He writes, quote, nymphs, you erewhile on simmering cauldrons played and called delighted savory to your aid, bade round the youth explosive steam aspire in gathering clouds and winged the wave with fire, bade with cold streams the quick expansion stop and sunk the immense of vapor to a drop. Pressed by the ponderous air, the piston falls, resistless, sliding through its iron walls. Quick moves the balanced beam of giant birth wields his large limbs and nodding shakes the earth. In the footnote to this passage, Darwin discusses the lengthy history of innovations and failures that led to the steam engine as an innovative success. He describes the patent dispute between Thomas Savory, who patented an early version of a steam pump in 1698, and Marquis of Worcester, who published plans for raising water by the explosive power of steam in 1663. The Marquis of Worcester only availed himself of the expansive force 
and did not know the, quote, advantages arising from condensing the steam by an injection of cold water. Savory's improvements addressed these issues, but his design was, quote, defective because it requires very strong vessels to resist the force of the steam, which ultimately caused the soldier joints of the engine to need frequent repair. He also cites a description of a steam pump, steam pump in 1630 by an unnamed French writer, which was, quote, scarcely practice, practicable as he describes it. Darwin goes on listing the deficiencies of the Papin, Newcomen, and Cauley methods, which introduced the piston but struggled with fuel efficiency and concludes, quote, the machine, however, remained imperfect. No matter how involved or considered each new design of the steam engine, the process of improving it would always remain incomplete and ongoing. This, again, is not what the verse that accompanies this footnote reflects. The nymphs who animate human and natural designs alike in this poem play on simmering cauldrons and called delighted savory to their aid. They gently bade the steam to gather into clouds and bade the expansion of air to stop, causing the piston to fall, which ultimately creates the rotational force of the steam engine to use for work. The action of the nymphs is as resistless as the piston falling through its iron walls that they, that they describe. Though this passage conveys a scene of mechanical work made possible by the messy, frustrating, and failure-laden process of innovation detailed in Darwin's footnotes, the verse portrays an effortless machine, perfectly fitting itself together as if by magic. The people who took part in making the steam engine possible, Savory, Worcester, Newcomen, Cauley, Papin, Walt, Bolton, etc., are all cynic dokely represented by the single figure of Savory. The ongoing story of human failure and the frustrations of the steam engine are reimagined as if they were a problem already solved, crystallized in the past tense, metered verse, and singular characters. And so we see here the temporal contradiction at the core of Darwin's vision of geoengineering, an occluded tension between the ongoing incomplete problems of human innovation and the imagined perfection of a future complete design. It is the process of aesthetically resolving this tension that I call a poetics of geoengineering. If geoengineering is an aesthetic category, the most obvious association that comes to mind might be the sublime. And indeed, this is where Oliver Morton turns toward at the end um, of his 2015 book called The Planet Remade, How Geoengineering Could Change the World. He writes, quote, I believe imagining human action on inhuman scales can reveal something sublime, a distant lightning of the mind. It offers the humble awe of being part of something so much greater than oneself, of knowing that people like you built the curved cliff of a dam that holds back a trillion tons of water, the space station seen climbing through the night sky, the far off city lights brightening half the night horizon. I can see arguments for geoengineering based on compassion, on duty, and on virtue. In the end though, should there not, must there not be an argument that stems from beauty? And this passage is what actually initially made me interested in addressing the aesthetics of modern geoengineering. Yes, I would answer. I believe we must consider the aesthetic dimensions of geoengineering, not only because an aesthetic argument is compelling and important, but also because geoengineering is historically an aesthetic concept. It asks human actors to readopt the mantle of the artisan god and take part in intentionally shaping the world for a particular purpose. So the material effects of capitalism and resource extraction have already violently pulled natural systems into a world ecology of our own making, the task of geoengineering differs in that it begins with a design and a theological purpose in mind. It is an act of creation of poesis, whether it is successful, harmful, or somewhere in between. I chose to look at the aesthetics of geoengineering through the lens of the gimmick, however, because the sublime cannot capture the contradictory experiences of living through climatological crisis. Edmund Burke, in his 1757 inquiry into the origin of ideas of the sublime and beautiful, includes what he calls immunity as one of the key components of his understanding of the sublime. Quote, when danger or pain press too nearly, he writes, they are, capable of in they are incapable of giving any delight and are simply terrible, but at certain distances and with certain modifications, they may be, and they are, delightful as we everyday experience. And so the experience of the sublime is predicated on being physically safe from any harm you might be witnessing. 
as a result of the totalizing effects of anthropogenic climate change, no one on earth is immune from climatological crisis. To appreciate the technological sublime of geoengineering is to imaginatively separate yourself from any possible risks and complications associated with it. In Northern California, as in many places around the world, this kind of imaginative thought experiment becomes more difficult with each passing day. The hottest recorded temperature on earth occurs down south in Death Valley, while fires burn earlier and earlier each year, turning the sky sickly colors and trapping us all indoors. The aesthetic experience of geoengineering can never be disinterested or distant, but must always be bound up in the difficulties and ironies of living in an increasingly unlivable world. As such, the gimmick's ability to index and elicit irony is what makes it a suitable framework for understanding the aesthetics of geoengineering. As CNI writes, quote, neither the judgments of the beautiful nor the sublime, for instance, unleash irony or promote satire in the exact way the gimmick does. The aesthetic feeling that is elicited when we are confronted by geoengineering as a word or concept is the feeling of suspicion towards something that is making an extravagant, seemingly inflated claim to value. Trying to survive in, let alone technologically design or improve, a broken world that is burning around you is a little, it's just inherently a little absurd. And the feeling of suspicion and guardedness arises from pairing climate change's very real physical dangers that could hurt you or other humans and, li and living things around the world with the lingering hope that technology might indeed someday have something to offer the climate crisis. There are many contradictions and ironies like this bound up in, a, in an aesthetic concept like geoengineering. And in this talk, I only covered one. Darwin's poetics of geoengineering and the poetics of techno-utopian proponents of geoengineering resolve the temporal contradictions of geoengineering by imagining it as already successful and complete. It is through this poetic process of folding its ragged uncertainties back into a perfectible future that geoengineering becomes a slippery, convincing concept. These poetics occlude geoengineering's contradictory temporal character, presenting it as something successful when it has not even begun. I believe there are many more ways to look at geoengineering as an aesthetic concept, but any treatment of the poetics of geoengineering must never separate itself from the lived experience of catastrophic climate change. Thank you. <laughs>